All right, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Glenn Cohen. I'm a professor at Harvard Law School, a deputy dean and the faculty director for the Petrie Flom Center. We're so delighted to have you with us for a book talk, Choose Your Medicine, Freedom of Therapeutic Choice in America. This is co-sponsored by the Harvard Law School Program on Law and History, the Petrie Flom Center and the Harvard Law School Library. I'm gonna introduce our panelists. We're gonna start with the author, Louis A. Grossman, who's professor of law and affiliate professor of history at American University, Washington College of Law. The respondent's gonna be Dr. William M. Sage, professor of law, medicine, and by courtesy government, as well as assistant VP in the Health Science Center at Texas A&M. And our moderator is going to be my amazing colleague, Ken Mack, a Lawrence D. Beale professor of law and affiliate professor of history at Harvard University. Before I turn it over to Professor Mack, I just want to give a few housekeeping items. We will be having an audience Q&A at the end of the session, so please submit your questions. The best way to do it is to use the Zoom Q&A feature, which if you scroll down to the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see a little button marked Q&A. You're also welcome to join the conversation or submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag ChooseYourMedicine. That's Choose Your Medicine, one word. If you're interested in this event and interested in other health policy, bioethics, biotechnology topics, we strongly encourage you to sign up for the Petrie Flom Center's newsletter, as well as reading our blog, Bill of Health. Check out our co-sponsors' websites as well, listed on the welcome slide. So with that, Professor Mack, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thanks very much. Um, we're going to jump right in. Uh, we've already introduced our uh, illustrious uh, speaker, Louis Grossman, and uh, the commentator, uh, Bill Sage. So um, Professor Grossman is going to start us off and we'll introduce the book for a bit. Uh, Professor Sage will uh, comment. And after that, I will um, uh, moderate the Q&A. So I'm going to just hand it over to Professor Grossman. So can you guys see the slides? on the screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for uh, attending this event. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, Petrie Flom uh, Center, the Harvard Law and History Program, and the Harvard Law School Library for co-hosting, and uh, a special thanks to my old friends, Ken Mack, Glenn Cohen, and Bill Sage, uh, for helping uh, make this what I hope will be a really uh, enlightening and, and interesting uh, event. Um, so uh, I'm speaking today about my recently published book, uh, Choose Your Medicine, Freedom of Therapeutic Choice in America. Um, here is the table of contents, and I will uh, do a quick tour through the book in the second half of the uh, talk, but I want to start uh, by contextualizing it. Um, my book starts with the story of University of Virginia student Abigail Burroughs. Um, she died of head and neck cancer in 2001 after unsuccessful attempts to gain access to experimental drugs not yet approved by the FDA. Um, her, fa her father founded an organization called Abigail Alliance, which in 2003 filed a federal lawsuit that I'm sure many of you remember um, against the FDA um, in Washington, D.C. Uh, the plaintiff sought an injunction prohibiting the agency from barring sales of post-phase one drugs to patients in desperate situations like Abigail's. And it based its claim on the theory of substantive due process, much spoken about recently, obviously, because of the Dobbs opinion. In 2006, the D.C. Circuit panel surprisingly ruled in favor of the alliance, but the following year, the full court reversed this decision. Both sides in this case applied the test from Washington v. Glucksburg, a 1997 case in which the Supreme Court declined to find a fundamental constitutional right to physician-assisted suicide, which is the topic of my last chapter. Um, the Glucksburg test which has also been thrust into prominence since Dobbs, because Dobbs relies on this test, asks, among other things, whether the asserted right is objectively deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. The majority and the dissenters in Abigail drew very different lessons from this nation's history 
And as a PhD historian, as well as a lawyer, I immediately started to wonder whose portrait was more accurate. I thus started researching this history myself, and I did not focus exclusively on formal legal materials. I also looked at petitions and speeches and magazine articles, legislative testimony, regulatory hearings, slogans chanted at street demonstrations. Moreover, I did not focus exclusively on drug regulation, but I also considered other forms of medical regulation that restrict patient choice, most importantly, the licensing of medical practitioners. And based on this research, I reached various conclusions, which I'll now review. First, throughout American history, a broad swath of the population has believed that people have a right to choose their preferred medical treatments without government interference. Second, Americans' arguments for freedom of therapeutic choice have frequently been constitutional arguments, even when made outside of court. By constitutional here, I mean not only the detailed provisions of the body of the U.S. Constitution, I'm also referring to Harvard professor Mark Tushnet's thin constitution, the broad foundational principles of equality, liberty, and self-governance set forth in the Constitution's preamble and in the Declaration of Independence. In my book, medical freedom advocates constantly invoke the Declaration's inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Third, my research re revealed that for most of American history, Bodily autonomy was just one of multiple strands of freedom rhetoric that featured prominently in therapeutic choice advocacy. And indeed, it did not begin to dominate until the 1970s. There are other really, really important strains of, uh, of argument um, in this arena. One of them is freedom of conscience and religion. The ideal of medical choice in America has always been inextricably intertwined with free exercise of religion. The link has often been one of analogy. The choice of a doctor and a system of medicine are deemed to be matters of conscience and of faith, akin to the choice of a priest and of a religion. Sometimes, however, the link is more direct, especially with respect to the spirit, spiritually infused alternative sects of the late 19th and early 20th centuries like mind cure and Christian science. Another important strain has been economic freedom. Sometimes this is just basic free market ideology, the argument that the government should allow practitioners and manufacturers to sell their treatments and let the market determine what's effective. But economic medical freedom arguments in this area have also always stressed anti-monopolism. They have drawn on Americans' deep-seated opposition to monopolies, especially monopolies supported by the state, as destructive of liberty. And this line of argument often fades over into paranoid conspiracy mongering, contentions that an avaricious access, I'm sorry, avaricious access of government and big money, whether it's organized medicine or the form or the pharmaceutical industry, are restricting medical choice to aggrandize their power and profit off American bodies. Another very important strain has been freedom of inquiry. Until the 20th century, the dominant notion was that widespread, unregulated trial and error was the best way to advance medical knowledge and develop new treatments. In the mid 20th century, this idea ran headlong into the emergence of the strictly regulated and restricted randomized controlled study as the gold standard of medical truth. Nevertheless, the traditional view persists in the American population and especially in the alternative medicine community that uncontrolled, uh, unregulated uh, um, research uh, by individual scientists and practitioners is the way to advance knowledge. During the COVID-19 pandemic, all of these longstanding tropes have pervaded the language of vaccine resistors and of hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin advocates. 
Still another theme that emerged from my research was the unusual politics around freedom of therapeutic choice, the theme of strange bedfellows. American medical freedom advocacy has long defied and bridged conventional political categories and social groupings. I describe alliances between Barry Goldwater and George McGovern on vitamin D regulation, between Pat Buchanan and gay activists on access to unapproved AIDS drugs, between Catholic conservatives and disability rights activists on physician-assisted suicide, and most recently between the American right wing and Robert F. Kennedy on vaccine resistance. My final overarching discovery, except during the 20th century, the mid 20th century, an era with an utterly atypical confidence in establishment institutions, in expertise and in science, arguments for the freedom of therapeutic choice have tended to win in America. American judges have only rarely ruled in favor of freedom of therapeutic choice. But if you look at statutes and at regulations and at referenda and initiatives, and very importantly, at enforcement patterns and jury conduct, you'll find that American law has preserved therapeutic choice to a surprising degree throughout most of its history. Thus, a medical, medical freedom advocacy epitomizes popular constitutionalism, the creation of constitutional law by the people rather than by judges. So let me give you a quick overview of uh, the chapters of the book. The first chapter of the book um, focuses on Benjamin Rush. Benjamin Rush was a Renaissance man almost at the level of Franklin or Jefferson. He was a professor of medicine at Penn, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, a member of Pennsylvania's ratifying convention, and a treasurer of the U.S. Mint. Many today consider him to be the father of American Orthodox medicine and the exemplar of heroic medicine in particular. Surprisingly, however, he was also a powerful advocate for freedom of therapeutic choice. He resisted medical licensing, he urged regular doctors to cooperate with folk healers. He opposed government prohibitions against any remedy and the compelled use of any remedy. And in advancing these arguments, he used all four strains of medical libertarianism that I identify in the book and trace throughout American history. Indeed, Benjamin Rush has always had a doppelganger identity in American culture reflected today on alternative medicine and medical freedom websites. He's the author of an apocryphal medical freedom amendment to the Constitution, which states the Constitution of this Republic should make special provision for medical freedom. He never actually proposed such an amendment, but it's not inconsistent with his general beliefs. My second chapter focuses on uh, an unschooled itinerant healer from New Hampshire named Samuel Thompson, who was the founder of the most popular alternative medical sect of the early 19th century. It was a botanical approach that um, was based on lobelia, cayenne pepper, and steam baths. Thompsonianism was also a political force. It waged an extraordinarily successful war against medical licensing. Thompsonians attacked licensing as an oppressive, freedom-stripping conspiracy between organized medicine and captured state governments. Just to show their success, in 1825, 18 of 24 extant states had medical licensing. By the time of the Civil War, because of the Thompsonians' efforts, no effective medical licensing existed in any state in the Union. I then moved to the Gilded Age, and I show that even when medical licensing resurged in the latter part of the 19th century, the statutes were written and enforced in a way that protected alternative practitioners, from homeopaths to osteopaths to practitioners of mind cure and Christian science. And these are pictures of two people who represent the dominant arguments along with anti-monopolism in the Gilded Age. On the left is William James, who stressed 
the importance of freedom of inquiry in the progress of knowledge. And on the right is Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of uh, Christian Science, who emphasized the freedom of religion. Then I address the progressive era, and I focus on how, even though public health um, efforts advanced greatly um, in the progressive era, medical freedom proponents largely reined in um, what they called uh, derogatorily state medicine. I talk about the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act, which was interpreted in a way that treated earnest claims of therapeutic effectiveness as a matter of opinion beyond proper government regulation. It punished only fraudulent claims. Another notable triumph of American medical freedom activists was the astonishing 1912 defeat of a bill that would have created a national health department. This seemingly anodyne proposal gave rise to a powerful resistance movement under the aegis of National League of Medical Freedom. The bill's opponents successfully portrayed it as a tyrannical conspiracy by the AMA to gain control of the country's entire health apparatus and squelch Americans' freedom of therapeutic choice. I then turn to the mid 20th century, often called the golden age of medicine. This was an age of atypical trust in American institutions broadly and in American medicine and science in particular. As recently as 1966, and I always find this astonishing, 73% of Americans reported that they had great confidence in the leaders of medicine and 76% stated that they trusted the federal government to do what is right most of the time, 76%. Following the 1955 introduction of the polio vaccine, its creator, Jonas Salk, regularly ranked as one of the most admired men in the United States on the level of Mickey Mantle or James Dean. And Americans by the millions rolled up their sleeves even before approval of the vaccine to participate in trials. Now, during the golden age of medicine, there was medical freedom activism, most notably with respect to quack cancer cures, but it was confined largely to the extreme right wing and it had little actual effect on policy. The picture on the left is of the red baiting anti-Semitic fascist sympathizer the Reverend Gerald Winrod, who led the movement in favor of the Hoxi cancer treatment. He asserted that the AMA and the pharmaceutical industry were both part of a vast conspiracy along with communists in the federal government. The picture on the right shows that years before the AIDS activists uh, took over the FDA, there were um, medical freedom protests in America. This is a protest in front of the White House uh, in the early 1960s in favor of the quack cancer cure for biosin. The 1970s were an inflection point in Americans' attitude toward freedom of therapeutic choice. There was an amazingly rapid loss of trust in major institutions and expertise. They, this um, faith in the nation's institutions plummeted in reaction to the Vietnam War, Watergate, the oil crisis, and stagflation. Confidence in science and medicine fell precipitously along with confidence in other establishment institutions. Um, an emblematic 1970s event, which is striking in particular in its contrast to the triumph of the polio vaccine, was the swine flu vaccine fiasco of 1976, where President Gerald Ford's administration, uh, in conjunction with the AMA and um, the medical establishment in general, said that there was a, uh, a scary swine flu epidemic uh, coming and tried to vaccine the entire country. Uh, the epidemic never really emerged and predictably um, 
some people died of Guillain-Barre syndrome from the vaccine. By 1980, only 32% of Americans had great confidence in the leaders of medicine, and only 25% trusted the federal government. Think about the rapidity of that drop from the statistics I gave you before from 1966. And Americans' faith in its establishment institutions, including medicine, has never recovered. The 1970s was also the era of a rights revolution. Most importantly for our purposes, patients' rights and women's rights. The abortion rights movement helped make the right to choose and bodily autonomy dominant tropes in American therapeutic freedom advocacy. I show how in the 1970s, some judges expanded Roe v. Wade into a more general freedom of therapeutic choice decision. Courts used the case to uphold the right to medical marijuana, a right to acupuncture, a right to, uh, uh, sorry, a right to refuse life-sustaining medical treatment, and a right to laetril. So some of you uh, on this, participating in this session may remember laetril. It was a vitamin, quote unquote, derived from apricot pits that was widely embraced during the 1970s as an alternative cancer cure. Not a single controlled trial demonstrated any efficacy against cancer, and FDA thus treated it as an illegal, unapproved new drug. Nonetheless, countercultural hippies and feminists joined fundamentalist Christians and conservative libertarians in a powerful social movement in favor of the drug and against orthodox medicine's authority. 27 states passed laetrile legalization statutes. More than twice as many people in America supported legalizing it as opposed to uh, legalizing it. The editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine suggested that the FDA allow people to use the drug. Congress seriously considered stripping the FDA of its power to review drug efficacy, and a federal district court and court of appeals blocked FDA's enforcement activities against Laetrile before the Supreme Court ultimately reversed them. Although Laetrile itself faded away as a cause in the early 1980s, both federal and state law have ever since accommodated the presence of complementary and alternative medicine to a remarkable extent, as I show in the book. And to these communities, the AMA is the enemy along with the FDA and the pharmaceutical industry. I also examine the epic struggle by AIDS activist groups in the late 1980s and early 1990s to persuade the FDA and Congress to permit pre-approval access to AIDS drugs and to speed their approval. This is different from many of the other movements I examine because it's a movement for freedom within orthodox medicine. The AIDS movement had remarkable success in reforming federal regulations and federal statutes um, to hasten the approval of drugs, to allow drug approval based on less evidence of efficacy, and to make drugs more available to desperately ill patients prior to approval. And we continue to see the reverberations of this movement today. I examine the uh, story of medical marijuana legalization. Now, marijuana has a unique dynamic because of its disfavored alternative use as a recreational drug. There was moralistic opposition to marijuana use, and there was also interesting intramovement tension between those advocating for medical use and those seeking full legalization. Medical marijuana legalization has been a stunningly successful movement at the state level. It started with the passage of California Proposition 215 in 1996. Today, 36 states have legalized the use of medical marijuana. And of course, a number of additional states or overlapping states in some instances have also legalized recreational marijuana. As I near the end here, I have a chapter called the freedom to be covered, which addresses the relationship between demands for freedom of therapeutic choice and health insurance. Since 2000, we have seen the assertion not only by patient advocates,
but also paradoxically by conservatives of a right to therapeutic choice in the context of reimbursed health care. Every hint of a limitation on insurance coverage provokes cries like rationing, like rationing and death panel. And the federal government, as I show, usually surrenders to such demands. My final chapter focuses on the movement for legalization of physician-assisted suicide. Compared to medical marijuana, a movement which started at about the same time, this movement has seen very slow progress. Only about 10 states have legalized physician-assisted suicide. And I consider why it is that Americans remain more ambivalent about physician-assisted suicide than the other treatments and products discussed in the book. And there's some very obvious differences, of course, the difference between death and restoring health. But I also want to emphasize that the very same suspicions about the motives of establishment institutions that bolster the support of freedom of therapeutic choice in other contexts lead many to oppose physician-assisted suicide. Thus, disability rights activists and elderly people and African-Americans join the anti-PAS physician-assisted suicide forces because they are concerned about being undervalued by society and even about the threat of forced euthanasia and eugenics. I started writing this book well before the emergence of COVID-19, but the pandemic offered a treasure trove of material and a surge of last minute additions. But it was sort of like building an airplane while it was in the air. Um, and uh, I maybe have to write a second edition of the book in the future so that I can more gracefully weave the issues of uh, COVID-19 into the, uh, the narrative. Um, freedom of therapeutic choice has, of course, been a dominant theme from the right wing during the pandemic. This activism has been fueled by a deep distrust of America's establishment institutions, including the federal health bureaucracy, medical experts, and drug companies. And there has been um, a spread of conspiratorial rhetoric concerning these institutions. This picture of, is a, of a doctor named Simone, um, Simone Gold uh, of America's Frontline Doctors, uh, she participated in a rally for health freedom just before the uh, invasion of the Capitol and um, then went into the Capitol Rotunda and was uh, spouting uh, anti-vaccine uh, and pro-medical freedom uh, rhetoric in the Capitol. Um, there's been a disquieting correlation and even collaboration between those who resist medical orthodoxy and those who embrace a conspiratorial view in their politics. So where are we now? According to a February 2022 poll, after the approval or the emergency approval of the uh, vaccines, only 29% of US adults said that they had a great deal of confidence in medical scientists to act in the best interests of the public. I'm sure that many of you probably think that our country has gone off the rails. From a historical perspective, however, I argue that the country has simply reverted to its norm. Thanks for listening. And uh, next we'll uh, hear, hear from Professor Sage with some comments. Thanks very much. I don't know if you wanna exit the slides for now, give people a larger view. Lewis, it's a wonderful book. Th thank you, thank you for writing it. Um, highly recommended. It's um, it's a book that's uh, about people as well as about issues. It's not judgmental. It's incredibly human in its range of emotions and sources and facts and anecdotes and insights. Um, and I, it's interesting, my comments uh, pick up exactly where Lewis happened to end this presentation, uh, which is uh, the notion that um, if there's a norm 
that has persisted um, in American history in this respect. It is a norm of skepticism. Uh, it is a norm of independence. It is not a norm um, of deference, except where deference happens to um, align with um, these strands of, of individualism. Um, immediately, uh, what I thought of uh, reading this book and thinking about this presentation uh, was uh, Stanley um, Kubrick's classic 1964 uh, send up of the Cold War, uh, Dr. Strangelove. And um, that movie, which many of you will, will remember well, um, has to do with the insanity of mutually assured destructive destruction and the threat of uh, global thermonuclear war, though that last phrase is from a movie about 20 years later. Um, so it was easy enough to say, okay, Dr. Strangelove, how do I make this sort of Lewis's book? And so Dr. Doctor is intuitive. So Dr. Strange drug um, seemed um, an easy way to do it. But what I really wanted to emphasize in my own mind with the analogy wasn't the beginning of the title of the movie, it's the rest of the title of the movie, which uh, you'll remember is um, how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb, meaning uh, the hydrogen bomb. And um, I struggled for 15 minutes this morning trying to think, okay, well, what's a good, you know, rhyming word or alternative word that would capture Lewis's book. And I finally realized it was just sitting there right in front of me the whole time. So we can think of this as Dr. Strange Drug, uh, how I learned to stop worrying and love the balm, B-A-L-M. So that's my bad pun for today. But I think the point being, um, this type of skepticism is actually ingrained and normal and recurrent. And um, it is certainly worrisome in some of its respects, uh, but to think that in some ways we are in an aberrant period of history uh, is incorrect. And a lot of the things that we uh, like and things we don't like about our healthcare system and are about our public health system and about how neither of them is actually a functional system and the lack of connections between them uh, comes from this very persistent strand. I also appreciate Lewis's connection uh, between sort of this set of historical antecedents and notions of uh, a thin constitution, notions of popular constitutionalism, uh, the idea that people uh, feel that they can interpret for themselves the uh, appropriate role of government in their lives. Um, it's also interesting to see the early um, manifestations of religious freedom that goes alongside uh, this popular constitutionalism. And certainly if there's one piece of this that I would emphasize in sort of the current uh, popular political and at least at the Supreme Court level judicial moment, um, it's that uh, both free speech and um, free exercise of religion uh, are now likely to be very deeply ingrained in how we navigate this particular terrain. Um, so, you know, how, how I learned to stop worrying and, and love the balm is probably uh, my first lesson from Lewis's outstanding presentation. Um, a lot of this history is about um, the limits of collectivism in American society and, you know, the ways in which an occasional wartime coalescence, an occasional sort of fully manifested depression that was economic depression that was escaped uh, become sort of sources of uh, collective confidence, trust, um, and action for some period of time before, you know, we have the luxury of revert, reverting to these, these patterns of individuality. So, I, I mean, I think in many areas of law that I work with, including antitrust law, um, looking back at, at the wartime experiences at those rare periods where we have sort of collective coalescence around issues, um, is, is a good way to then understand the evolutions outside of those periods. Uh, sometimes they're financial and governmental investments. Uh, sometimes they're patterns of corporate or industrial behavior. Sometimes they're sort of popular um, moments of more or less trust um, in the collective. And, you know, I think that wartime, peacetime description that, that surfaces from time to time in Lewis's book um, is uh, useful. Um, what I say just sort of 
by way of transitioning to a more open conversation today and get and get Lewis's sense of these issues. Um, one thing that's fascinating about Lewis's book is it has an introduction, but it doesn't have a conclusion. Uh, it ends with a highly perceptive chapter, as he mentioned, on um, physician-assisted suicide and other end-of-life decision-making. But there is no wrap-up because, as he says, he was uh, trying to rebuild the plane while he was flying it. And yes, there certainly is room for a second edition, but I think there is a certain strength in not having a conclusion. This doesn't tie into a package of the end of history. This is um, just simply an explanation, a very perceptive one of how to best understand the moment we occupy, even though there's no way that we have progressed beyond it. And so that lack of conclusion is, I think, important. Um, the last thing I would say is that, uh, particularly on the food and drug regulatory side, the regulatory regimes have all been fundamentally about information. The substantive requirements of dem demonstrating safety in advance, of demonstrating effectiveness, these are add-ons to what was you know, initially um, about full disclosure of ingredients, lack of fraud, um, restraining the excesses of commercialism, of marketing, um, of advertising, even when the people who were motivated not solely by profit, but also by uh, a scientifically unjustifiable uh, belief in their own products. And um, we are, as we all know, fundamentally challenged by um, information in our society. And this is not, of course, limited to the health and healthcare domains, uh, but it is general. And in this respect, I think I'd end by quoting my favorite sentence uh, in, in Lewis's book. Um, it, it's, um, I think, just a brilliant sentence. Uh, it's one of the things that made me really like the book early in my first read through it. It's the first sentence of chapter four on uh, page 75, and it reads in its entirety as follows. Uh, on May 3rd, 1900, the American School of Magnetic Healing got no mail. And then it tells the story of the federal attempt through mail fraud statutes to interdict the fundamental communication happening between um, a large purveyor of uh, arguably ineffective treatment and its base of uh, customers and supporters. Um, there is no way today for any of the purveyors of misinformation and disinformation um, to get no mail. And amplification of misinformation, disinformation, um, is instant and inevitable and sometimes algorithmic and commercial and often deliberate. And, you know, I think if there's um, a point here beyond understanding the norm and learning to um, love the balm, it's to focus on the long-term investments, the long-term precautions uh, that we may be able to make over considerable periods of time with considerable setbacks uh, to um, make our informational environment as sound and healthy as we can. And let me leave it there. And thank you very much, Lewis, for a wonderful book. Well, um, thanks to you both uh, for great presentations. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to actually ask Lewis if he wants to respond to Bill, anything Bill said. But before that, I want to remind the participants, the audience, that you can submit questions. Um, I think you can do it through Zoom. There's a Q&A function. And uh, there was another way that <laughs> the uh, Petri Flom, Flom folks um, announced at the beginning of this, but I can't remember it. But uh, please feel free to submit questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. But for the moment, let me ask Lewis whether he wants to respond to anything that, uh, that Bill raised. Well, thank you so much for those uh, really generous comments, Bill. Um, thank you also for telling me uh, that you thought the lack of a conclusion was actually effective um, because it troubled me. Um, I got to call the last chapter the end because it was about physician-assisted suicide. Um, and I had a you know finishing paragraph that 
um, tied it back to everything that I've been speaking about. But I don't really know what the what the end of this is. Um, and uh, you know, the book is about continuity as well as 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 about change. And um, maybe leaving it hanging uh, is is the right way to go. So thank thank you very much uh, for that, Bill. And also for reading that sentence. I mean, I tried to write this book in a way that would be a pleasurable reading experience as well as a uh, purveyor of information. And um, at least with the first sentence of that chapter, I scored with you. Okay, great. Um, Bill, any response? You don't have to, but uh, just uh, gonna allow you to respond if you want to. No, uh, Ken, I'm actually interested if you have a couple of um, issues to raise for Lois. Yeah, and so, uh, sure, well, let me ask a question and uh, remind the audience uh, questions are starting to come in. Please submit your questions to the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, quick question for Lewis. Well, actually, not so quick because I'm a professor. Um, but um, you can run this book through um, kind of all of American history, which you do. Um, it's, it's about dissenters. There, there have always been dissenters from the medical orthodoxy. Um, but there's a bunch of things that happen alongside that. The, the growth of the organized medical profession, that's the 20th century. Um, the growth of the federal, mostly federal bureaucracy that inter intersects with that. And that's kind of the um, latter half of the 20th century. The growth of the insurance industry and the growth of deep skepticism about government, which sort of feeds into all that. So there's a way in which, you know, all those things that we've argued about involving choice and freedom simply just run their way through this, this book about therapeutic, therapeutic choice. So I'm wondering, you know, what about medicine is different than other kinds of arguments about choice, either that we're having right now or that we've historically had? Thanks, Ken. What is different about medicine? I mean, I think that um, at one point I have a sentence that says medicine is not like, uh, you know, building widgets. Uh, it, it has to do uh, with deep issues of, uh, of deeply held uh, values of bodily autonomy. And as I show in the book, even uh, spiritual autonomy uh, for many people. Um, but, I, but I'll also say that um, um, you, you observe that even in the, in, the, uh, in the face of these developments that I describe, there's been a, uh, a uh, inexorable growth in the federal health bureaucracy, in the insurance bureaucracy, um, and, uh, and in the medical bureaucracy over the course of the 20th century. Um, and um, so I don't mean to suggest that the theme of this book is how, uh, you know, medical freedom activists have kept, <laughs> you know, medicine free. Um, but I do want to emphasize that the effect that they've, they've had on these things um, over time. And indeed, if you think about, for example, uh, fee for service insurance, um, it lines up uh, very, very well with um, freedom of therapeutic choice from the perspective of, of patients. And I would argue that to some extent, the pickle we're in as a society right now is largely due to this commitment to freedom of therapeutic choice, because you can't simultaneously have freedom of therapeutic choice and have insurance coverage for those choices and have a uh, a controlled uh, budget for for health in the country. And so um, I don't really emphasize this uh, extensively in the book, but I really do think it's one of the main problems the United States has um, in terms of its health system. Okay, great. Um, so questions are start to, starting to roll in. I remind the audience, you know, submit questions on the Q&A function. I'm going to ask the uh, one of the questions that's come in, and you know we've got two sort of um, very learned experts, so either of you can respond to these. I think the question is directed at Lewis, but but Lewis and Bill, um, I wonder if either of you want to. Um, we've got a question that reads this way: Can you speculate 
on how our system will deal with artificial intelligence and proprietary or secret AI in particular. Oh. So, <laughs> um, so I'm trying to tie my answer to that question back into the theme of my book, and I'm having a little bit of trouble doing so. Um, I can I can say, so let let's not spend too much time on my completely tangential answer, but let me just say that you know the FDA used to be a life sciences agency. And increasingly, it has become a, a, a cyber agency as well. And the, the Center for Medical Devices is of growing importance going forward. And it is struggling to figure out how to deal with the blurry lines between speech on the one hand and, and clinical decision making on the other hand, um, and how you go about regulating a product which maybe has a machine learning algorithm that is constantly evolving. Um, it's one of the great regulatory challenges that FDA faces going forward. Thanks, that's actually really interesting. I wasn't expecting that at all. You clearly have a lot of knowledge of this topic. Bill, did you wanna jump in on that or is that, or are you wanna wait? I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you move to another question so we get a few more in. Okay. Uh, we've got a question from Professor Glenn Cohen. Uh, for Lewis, any prediction on how the movement around psychedelics will play out based on this history? So I, I think that psychedelics are the next, uh, the next uh, front in the movement for freedom of therapeutic choice. Uh, just for those of you who may not know, uh, psychedelics, um, have been, uh, it, there's strong suggestions, including a study that came out yesterday in the New England Journal, uh, that psychedelics um, can be quite effective in treating uh, intractable, intractable, did I say that word right? Uh, um, uh, mental illness, including PTSD and uh, depression. And I think that there is a growing movement in favor of uh, making it available for treatment use. It presents many of the same problems that medical marijuana did. Um, it's a Schedule I controlled substance. It has alternative disfavored uses. And it is, if you're talking about psilocybin or, or other uh, or peyote or things like that, it comes in a hard to characterize, um, hard to make consistent natural form. And in all of these ways, I think that uh, you can see um, parallels to the medical marijuana um, story. Um, but the medical marijuana story is one of great success, ultimately, uh, one of state legalization combined with uh, federal acquiescence. And uh, you may well end up seeing the same thing, same thing happen in this area. I mean, here, here, here I would sort of supplement that um, by, by saying that sort of movements in general to um, acquire access to things that have been restricted, I typically am supportive of them cautiously, but I, they, don't, they don't trouble me. There's way too much in my view within sort of US health and healthcare that has been very tightly controlled and both unjust and wasteful at the same time. And so I'm generally in favor of, I think th this, continuation of a historical norm does not does does not bother me. Uh, there are times when one wonders about the collective financial impact, but most of the time these are small issues. What I do wonder about um, is when we do have something like a major collective public health threat of the COVID variety, when people are resisting an intervention on individual grounds, uh, and we just have learned to work through that in some way. I do think the informational amplification risks um, and the way that that can be so self-serving these days is is particularly problematic. But if it's if it's a collective threat that we need to have some sort of confidence in collectively emerging from, then it gets to a level of concern for me. For most of these others, it it does not. I also think that um, it's a beneficial policy insight to realize that in healthcare. 
Um, much of what we do is the exchange of information and expertise. Sometimes it's reduced to a um, hard product or a diagnostic that has a, a physical technological manifestation, but most of what we think of as the medical environment is actually fundamentally informational and for a lot of reasons it should be fundamentally free. And, and one more comment, uh, you know, I speak a lot in the book about the unusual politics of freedom of therapeutic choice movements. Uh, this has the, uh, the possibility of being uh, similarly bipartisan and unpredictable because it combines the more traditional mental health advocacy groups with potentially veterans because a lot of the PTSD um, uh, that is intractable and people are hoping to be able to treat is in the veterans community. And let me add, one can expect there will also be a lot for support of support for it within the healthcare workforce, because the healthcare workforce is also enormously affected by the pandemic experience of PTSD. Great. Um, we've got another question. Uh, I'm going to just read it out because it's a little long. To what extent do these attitudes of individualism and freedom of choice treat straight white men differently than women, people of color, and others? For example, some of the same political forces promoting freedom of therapy, therapeutic choice now are also aligned with opposition to abortion and to transgender therapy. Do you explore these trends in the book? Um. So certainly uh, women, uh, people of color, um, uh, marginalized populations are, are, are characters throughout uh, much of my book, although not um, the central focus. Um, I, I, I will say that, um, um, you know, the, the Dobbs opinion um, uh, is resisted as a judicial um, opinion um, and certainly there's going to be great resistance on the right um, to uh, expanding it any further into a medical freedom uh, decision. Um, but that being said, there's nothing that's going, nothing about what's happening with abortion uh, that is going to necessarily inhibit uh, a bipartisan expansion of uh, support for medical freedom in in the broader body politic, um, even if if outside of court, um, I, I, I think that uh, you know I, I think one of the more interesting uh, discussions I have um, of the uh, of, of this issue, uh, slightly different point, is in the um, um, well, both in the medical marijuana chapter and in the physician assisted suicide chapter. Um, What's interesting is originally the African American community was much more resistant to mar marijuana, medical marijuana legalization uh, than than the white community was. In part because they were aware of the uh, trauma that you know uh, controlled substances uh, had had um, caused in their communities. But what's interesting is that over time. Uh, African Americans have become as supportive, according to polling, at least in some places, as as white Americans to uh, to marijuana, uh, medical marijuana legalization. But the the other fascinating phenomenon I discuss is how African Americans are much less likely to support physician assisted suicide than white Americans, and this is this comes this is because of a well earned skepticism in the medical establishment, in the, uh, the commitment of this country to providing people with the uh, services and healthcare they need, and the devaluing of certain populations, it slides over into a suspicion that what's gonna end up happening is that uh, African-Americans in, in particular will be viewed as more dispensable and will end up being encouraged to use physician assisted suicide and maybe even there will be a a, a movement toward involuntary uh euthanasia uh, here i mean i think it's a very good question to ask i think lewis answers it brilliantly from the historical perspective i would just add that um 
in terms of what the the, the next um, frontier will be in these patterns, a really important question is whether um, the strange bedfellow alliances that take something over the legal threshold, whether those groups actually ever meaningfully talk to each other. Yeah, they, one, one interesting. Do, there's a lot of room for understanding and progress. You know, as interesting as the um, the right wing uh, conspiracy theory mongering and skepticism and, and resistance to orthodox medicine and vaccines in the pandemic, one interesting thing is the um, absence of broad resistance on the left. This is. This is unlike a lot of medical freedom movements throughout history that have been bipartisan. Um, I don't know whether it's the fact that it's a uh, communicable disease and progressives have a, a, a more robust um, focus on community interests. Have you thought about that at, at all, Bill? I mean, are you surprised that um, the, the the progressive side of America has has been as sort of almost uniformly accepting with with you know well with, except for you know, for, Ken Kennedy, except for Kennedy and, and a few others and, yeah. a, and a few others I mean I think it's um I think it's a good point I think one of one of the pieces I didn't spend time talking about was how risk and probabilistic thinking and the ability to do or not do that factors into the appreciation of these situations. It's very striking, as cataloged by Lewis in the book, that there people assert a right to therapeutic freedom when they are sick and a right to, free, to therapeutic freedom when they're not sick. And, you know, both of these are situations where the, the mind strays to um, certainties and counterfactuals rather than to probabilities. Uh, I have something, this thing will cure me, I hope, and you're keeping me from getting it, or I'm fine and I'm probably going to stay fine, so why should I do this thing you want me to do? Uh, which is a little bit reminiscent of uh, the airbag debate for auto safety. Uh, an airbag causing a death was valued as a much greater harm than the lack of airbag facilitating a death. Great, so we've got, um, we're almost at time. So I've got one last question and I'll just pose it very briefly. It's, can you see a future for the corporate practice of med medical law? Uh, corporate practice in medical law, what's the future in light of the book? I'm not sure I understand the question. Corporate practice in medical law. Bill, do you understand the question? Not, not without a little clar clarification. Uh, but what I, what the only thing I would point to in Lewis's book and presentation, though I don't know if it answers the the particular questioner here, um, is we did have this fascinating period that kind of starts in the 1990s when I entered um, health law and policy of conflating what the government was doing with what a private insurance company was doing. And, and you know, Lewis alludes to this and, you know, a lot of the complaints uh, against the federal reform that didn't go anywhere in the early 90s were actually complaints about the private insurance industry. And then these get, you know, uh, mixed even more in the Affordable Care Act, which took a similar strategic approach. But the result was that the corporate practice of medicine then gets vilified much the way that the governmental practice of uh, medicine gets vilified. And I don't think Lewis would object that the last thing I say is tipping my hat to Paul Starr and his 1982 social transformation of medicine to say that, you know, the great success of the medical profession in creating its position of protected authority was to fend off both governmental control and corporate control. Thanks for handling that one, Bill. <laughs> You're welcome, yeah. Lewis. My pleasure. Well, um, thank you to you both for coming. My my old friend, uh, Lewis Grossman, and I'm very glad to see that my old friend, uh, can the camera find it? Uh, Lewis has a version of the book in front of him, which will be in focus, unlike my version. Um, go out and buy his new book. It's, uh, as Bill said, it's very well written. Lots of really colorful characters. You get a lot of the sense of the grand sweep of history, and you get a sense that this is something that's kind of really with us that we're going to be struggling about as we go forward. 
So thank you to Professor Lewis Grossman. Uh, thank you to Professor Bill Sage. And uh, thank you to the audience for, uh, for coming. Thank you, everyone.